So in this portion, we'll talk a little bit about the role specifically of the endothelial uh, cells. So um, again, your endothelium are particularly important because if your endothelium are healthy, um, they produce, let me open up our little guy here again, um, they produce antithrombotic molecules that prevent blood clots. Um, you know, they basically almost act like as bumpers um, to some of the many uh, harmful things that can um, you know, happen to the uh, arterial system. However, when subjected to various different structure, uh, stressors like um, you know, hypercholesteremia um, or inflammation or other, other factors, uh, they can start becoming prothrombotic. Um, and they become into this uh, activated state. And there's many different things that can cause this. Turbulent flow, um, hypertension potentially even of itself. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, different um, you know, bacterial infections can lead to endothelial dysfunction. Actually, we're finding that uh, your risk of cardiovascular uh, or uh, acute cardiovascular events goes up when you have acute in acute infections, actually quite significantly. Um, glycogen end products, which we see in diabetics, uh, can affect endothelial function, um, different viruses, and different uh, exposures to tobacco smoke. Um, and again, when our endothelium become activated, they ex increase expression of pro uh, coagulant factors, adhesion molecules, which again attract um, our cytokines and allow them to pass through into the basement membranes of our um, arterial wall. Again, again, remembering your your you know your stages of margination, diapetes, and um, you know emigration into you know through or across the uh, endothelium. And again. If we address some of these factors, um, you know, we can improve endothelial function, thereby you know, reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease or at least its progression. Uh, I have here highlighted um, again this this weird role or interesting role between dysfunction of the endothelium and hypertension. So we know that uh, there are you know in, in individuals with these risk factors, it can lead to endothelial dysfunction, which alters NOET1 balance, thereby increasing vascular resistance and therefore hypertension. However, if we expose uh, blood vessels to higher pressure or higher luminal pressures, uh, that can also lead to endothelial dysfunction. So sometimes we ask, is it a chicken or the egg? Is it the endothelium? Um, or is it the you know the pressure? And which ones which one goes dysfunctional first? And it's likely a contribution of both. You know, and same's kind of true here with this uh, you know turbulent flow. You know, again, turbulent flow is not great for our blood vessels. However, um, and endothelium. However, when our endothelium become you know um, activated and we have these plaque formations, that also leads to worsening turbulent flow. So many of these things are cyclical in nature um, and can potentiate each other um, as well. So again, the role of our endothelial cells, again, you can think of it almost as our, uh, you know, bumpers, but um, when they're healthy, they resist leukocyte adhesion and, um, you know, inhibit inflammation and they release nitric oxide, which are also really you know, important for maintaining vascular health. Um, laminar shear stress favors, you know, we have normal blood flow uh, through the vessels. Uh, we, it favors endo production, it favors uh, superoxide dismutase, which helps protect and buffer against reactive oxygen species. When we have turbulent flow, we don't get as much stimulation of that um, or, or mechanotransductive stimulation of the endothelium, and we see less um, of these uh, factors, you know, including Krupa-like factor, which also uh, mediates some of this Im immune response um, and, you know, adhesion, you know, uh, processes. Uh, so again, endothelial dysfunction, we really think, uh, sets the stage for um, cardiovascular disease. And again, we see this first develop at branch points because they're more um, subject to turbulent flow just due to the, the nature of the bifurcations. And they're less likely to have some of these effects of the endothelium. They tend to have maybe a little bit less um, as well. But yeah, the, I mean, when you have this, these branch points, there's going to be more turbulence. And again, turbulent flow doesn't really lend itself to the mechanotransductive properties of laminar flow. Okay, so um, you'll, that's why we you know, we see this endothelial dysfunction develop there, and, and why we typically assess uh, for plaque formation at these landmarks, um, you know, like at your you know, the bifurcation of your carotid um, of your carotid arteries. Again, when we have these. Uh, 
you know, dysfunctional endothelium, increases permeability. Again, we talked about the pathobiology, inflammatory cytokines, um, you know, attract monocytes. Uh, we have leukocyte adhesion molecules that are attracted, and then we see, um, you know, more um, reductions in the uh, the number of these uh, vasodilatory uh, molecules. Now, again, um, we talked about kind of this process here. Again, endothelial dysfunction leading to uh, production of inflammatory cytokines, leukocyte adhesion, leukocyte recruitment, and foam cell progression. Again, really, um, the increased permeability of the endothelium is what allows the LDLs to enter into the, into the intima and set the stage for the formation of these plaques. And then the LDL accumulate into that subendothelial space um, and then kind of get trapped. And then we set the stage again for that um, you know, creation of the foam cells. And the foam cells eventually develop into fatty streaks and raised lesions. And this is just an electric, oh, sorry, moving on the slide. This is just an example of an electron microscopy of what we're seeing here in terms of these leukocyte interactions um, in an arterial wall and a hypercholesteremic human. And so um, not, not expecting you guys to kind of know that in super detail, um, but this is just um, an example of uh, the adhesion of mononuclear phagocytes into the in, uh, intact endothelium here in A. Um, 12 days after initiation of a hypercholesteremic diet. So just kind of zoomed in image. C and D just demonstrate um, some of the interdigitations uh, between the monocyte and the endothelium. And you can see how they almost come in contact with two separate into, uh, endothelial cells uh, here. But again, we're not, I'm not expecting you guys to know this stuff or recall this um, uh, on a lecture, on an exam, but just you know for your own education. Um, so again, we talked about the evolution of, of atherosclerotic plaques. Again, fatty streaks kind of wax and wane. They can be reversible, um, but if we continue to uh, not address lifestyle factors, they can again become raised in significant lesions. And then we talked again about like kind of where they develop. Again, on our branch points um, and in our coronary arteries, uh, we, we see it in our major arteries, and then we have a plaque rupture creating a thrombus and then uh, blocking flow distally. Okay, again, very rarely do you see like a full sclerosis of the artery. It's usually we have a you know a lesion that ruptures, creates a thrombus, and maybe that thrombus embolizes and goes you know up to the brain. You have a have a stroke or go somewhere else. You end up having a heart attack. Okay. Now, when we have a significant lesion, um, you know, again, we can have these, um, this, we have this fibrous cap uh, that surrounds the top of the, the, the lesion, okay, the, lip, the lipoprotein. Um, this, this cap includes collagen and calcium deposits, um, that, which makes this kind of grayish or whitish appearance. Again, we kind of showed an image of what this, of an atheroma or plaque lesion looks like. Um, again, if it's significant, it starts to narrow the vessel lumen um, and then proliferate uh, you know, further along the vessel. As we age with uh, these lesions, uh, they begin to grow in size. And, they, and if they grow in size and the cap of that lesion is thin, they can become quite unstable or a complicated lesion. And if they rupture, you develop uh, this thromboembolytic event, um, which again can cause, um, you, know, you know, these acute, you know, coronary events or, or, or um, you know, heart attacks or strokes. Again, um, if that you know, fibrous cap uh, ruptures. And it's just an example here, you know, where we have these, you know, this fibrous plaque or cap to the fibrous plaque and if it ruptures, move my, if it ruptures, you know we have the formation of a thrombus, and if that thrombus travels elsewhere, we can have uh, complications, pretty significant ones. Um, <clears throat> in some individuals, though, especially our older individuals with coronary artery disease. Like I mentioned, this fibrous cap does remodel, and you do get collagen and calcium further embedding and, and depositing into that uh, cap. 
So in some individuals, this plaque gets stabilized, stabilized okay? So you can have really significant lesions, um, but they're fairly stable. So these individuals might get chest pain um, because they may get to a point where they just can't deliver enough flow maybe to, to their heart or they get claudication pain and they can't deliver enough blood flow to their legs. Um, but they're not at a high risk for an acute like myocardial infarction because they're not like that plaque like that plaque's cap isn't probably going to rupture um, just because it's so so um, so thickened. Okay, uh, where in some individuals, especially younger individuals, very significant lesions, you know that there may be a really kind of big almost powder keg uh, plaque, and if that cap ruptures, you know then they're in trouble. Okay, because that, that cap's just not not as thin. So again, there's there's two more phylogies to this: these these stable lesions versus unstable lesions. Which you might hear, um, you know, something you know, here in the literature, or here discussed, you know, a stable angina, a stable plaque uh, versus an unstable or a complicated lesion. Okay, and this is just an example of this here. So you can have these vulnerable plaques. Um, we have individuals. Oops, let me move my. Um, we have these, you know, uh, very thin fibrous caps on a very kind of thick lipid core and that ruptures, you have all these problems um, where you can have individuals with, you know, um, you know, pretty significant lesion, much smaller lumen, right? Probably worse flow distally, but that fibrous cap is so thick, so much collagen, um, smooth muscle, calcium, that, that lesion is just, is very stable. So they may get chest pain, uh, they may get angina a certain workload, but you work below that, they're, they're fine, and they're really not as much of a risk for an acute event. They may have heart attacks for other reasons, the demand imposed MIs, but in terms of a thromboembolytic event, there's not as much risk. And again, you see this more in individuals with, uh, older individuals with um, coronary artery disease, um, and potentially some individuals who may have survived a heart attack. We start seeing, again, like, this potential remodeling um, or healed rupture. Um, but again, again, it's, it's really more aging um, and living kind of with, with uh, vascular, uh, vascular disease. So um, an overview again, the pathophysiology, endothelial dysfunction sets the stage. It's an inflammatory process, um, you know, involving many cellular markers. We develop fatty streaks, which initiate the event, which are basically created by these foam cells, which are LDL or modified LDL which are engulfed by our um, monocytes. And then these lesions develop if we don't address lifestyle factors. And again, it may be present as early um, you know, as your 20s. And it's interesting, we, we see this um, particularly in humans. We don't see this in some other species of mammals. And it's something we've actually, again, observed even in like mummies. So this is something that like maybe may be unique to humans, um, but the, you know, the, path, the pathophysiology is just kind of um, interesting in terms of how it relates to uh, anthropology. And again, this is another kind of re uh, review here. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, and again, just an example um, of you know what can develop here. So uh, we'll wrap up this section and then we'll move on to some of the complications uh, that may arise um, from atherosclerosis.